Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall Series. My name is Emily Kosick, and I'm the Knowledge Manager at SIPCERT. Our topic today is how to help your child through the pandemic. What should you know and what should you do? We're going to have a short presentation followed by a chance for you to ask your questions. If you have questions, you can use the question box to send it to us and we will answer them. This is a reminder that the town hall is being recorded. So if you miss something, you can watch it again later. For those of you in the audience who may be more comfortable following along with the slides in French, we have provided them as a PDF handout, which you can access through the handout box on the town hall control panel. It's also available on SIPSERT's French website under the information for this town hall. However, as a note, SIPSERT does not have permission for you to share these slides outside of the presentation. Please contact the individual presenter if you have questions or want to share the material in any way. Now I'm going to introduce our panelists, or to, sorry, our presenter for, presenters for today. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Andrea Stelnecki. She's a registered psychologist in Alberta and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Regina. Do you want to give a quick wave there, Andrea? Perfect. Next, we have Dr. Christy Wright. She's a registered psychologist and an associate professor of psychology at the University of Regina. Christy, if you just want to give a quick wave. Perfect. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys for the presentation. And again, just a reminder, you can send your questions throughout the presentation. Good morning and afternoon in some parts of Canada. Welcome to How to Help Your Child Through the Pandemic. What should you know? What should you do? As Emily indicated, I'm Dr. Christy Wright. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Regina, and I'm a registered doctoral psychologist in the province of Saskatchewan. My primary area of focus is anxiety in children uh, with typically functioning children, as well as children with special medical needs, chronic illness, such as cystic fibrosis and congenital heart disease. And I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Stelnicki to tell her a little bit about herself. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Andrea Stelnicki, and as Emily mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SIPCERT. Um, I'm also a registered psychologist in Calgary. Um, my research interests focus primarily on supporting the mental health of public safety and military personnel and their families. And then my clinical work focuses on supporting young people and their families with anxiety and depression. So prior to jumping into the overview of today's webinar, I wanted to make two points. So first, I wanted to start with something we all know, that parenting isn't easy on the best of days. And so when we throw in a pandemic into the mix, it's not surprising that parenting can be effective or affected. Um, researchers around the world are working to understand how parents are functioning in the face of this pandemic. Most recently, the American Psychological Association surveyed approximately 3,000 adults, 18 and older, and results from the survey demonstrated that parents are experiencing significantly higher levels of stress than adults without children. So that's not to say that every parent is negatively affected by COVID, as some have highlighted things like spending more time with their children has been positive, but stressors identified have included things like those related to education, such as delivery of online education for their children as being stressful, basic needs an issue, access to health care, and missing out on major milestones such as graduations. Um, this is American data, of course. Canadian data is not currently available, but an uh, Ontario study out of McMaster was launched in early May called the Ontario Parent Survey to assess how our parents are doing, and so we'll have access to that information um, in some time. Secondly, I also wanted to remind you that you were parents before COVID, um, as well as PSP, and you parented. You have um, skill sets there in your back pocket that you used before, and albeit this is a little bit different circumstances, they can be always applied here too. Sometimes in, in times of stress, we may not always access our existing skill set, but do it because you had those skills before and they were successful. Today, we hope to just add to that existing knowledge base and skill set. Um, the other point is that we're often referring to children throughout um, this webinar. Uh, we do in integrate adolescents or teens, but regardless, our approaches and our discussion apply across the uh, childhood and adolescence. So the webinar today will be comprised of background information about the current situation you are faced with as parents and PSP parents specifically. We will explore the cognitive behavioral model of behavior. This knowledge will allow for you to understand your and your child's response to the current situation. We'll end with connecting this new knowledge about why we might behave the way we do with recommendations and how we can help our children through the current pandemic experience. Now I'll hand the floor over to my colleague, Dr. Stelnicki. Yeah. 
So as Dr. Wright just said, you know, during this pandemic, we are being faced with some additional stressors, some potential stressors that might have impacts on our mental health. And prior to the pandemic, um, we, you know, were PSP. Uh, if you were a parent, you were also parenting before COVID. So some of the PSP specific stressors that um, we are hearing about within uh, the current pandemic are uh, the challenging work situation. Um, interacting with the public brings new risks like concerns about being exposed to the coronavirus while on shift. Um, shifts might include some unexpected overtime, uh, rapidly changing information about the virus, per personal protective equipment and organizational policies and having to keep up with all of those things. Now, we also add on to that our regular family obligations. So things like Dr. Wright just mentioned, homeschooling, finding adequate, reliable and safe childcare for when you're on shift, uh, concerns about infecting family members. And we've heard from some PSP who are choosing to isolate themselves from their family members. All of these things compound the, the typical stress of being um, a parent and a PSP, uh, especially during this pandemic. Uh, we are lucky to see a little bit of new research coming out related to the current pandemic, but we can also take uh, some research for, uh, that was conducted shortly following the SARS outbreak and the H1N1 uh, pandemic from 2009 and it, it's matching up, what we're seeing right now is matching up with, with what we previously saw. So essential workers who are parents are experiencing increased psychological distress compared to essential workers who are not parents. Increases in symptoms of anxiety and depression and other mental disorders are appearing to be driven by constant worrying about the impact that their work has on family, the logistics of managing the household, being on call or having to leave to go to work unexpectedly and not really sure what you're going into. Again, those increased risks of being exposed to coronavirus and then not having enough time for meaningful family activities during the response. These are all stressors or worries that you might be having right now. And I would encourage you to think about any of these factors or, or others that might be increase, increasing the stress for you either at work or at home. And I, I do wanna highlight that although the research tells us that being a child of a first responder or public safety personnel increases the risk for childhood distress, so things like symptoms of anxiety, depression, or behavioral challenges, I really wanna emphasize that it's just a risk factor. Being a child of a PSP is not a determining factor to have problems. If your child is doing okay right now, that's great. You don't need to be looking for problems because most children will adjust uh, well. If your child does need a little bit more support right now, that's why we're here talking to you today. And every child is going to respond a little bit differently to the current situation. So every parent's going to need to adjust their parenting strategies a little bit, depending on what's happening for your family. As indicated earlier, I'm gonna walk through the CB model of behavior. Behavior. Not just to give you useless information, because that's not what we're here to do today, but to help inform you um, of your The cognitive behavioral model, or that CB model of behavior, suggests that feelings, body sensations, thoughts are all connected in direct behavior. So the more that we understand what directs our individual behavior, are able to identify feelings, body sensations, thoughts that precede behaviors that we may um, see as unhelpful in our lives, the quicker and more efficiently we can choose ways or strategies to intervene. With that in mind, let's quickly take a look at the individual components and then bring it all together to, for it to make sense. Let's start with feelings. So there are a myriad of feelings. Uh, when we're young, we learn to write words for emotions. So here are a few anxious, confused, happy, angry. When we are young and as we grow and develop, we learn to recognize emotions in others. One way to notice in others is by observing others' faces or their facial expressions. We look to someone's mouth, their eyes, their eyebrows, and that helps us inform or understand how someone might be feeling. We also use that information uh, to learn how we feel. So we look at our faces and also look at those, those facial features to determine what emotions we might be experiencing. Another way our body informs us or gives us hints about what we're feeling are body sensations. 
our bodies give us hints about how we're feeling. So for example, when someone's anxious, one may experience a whole host of symptoms, such as the, the symptoms that are showing up on the screen right now. So someone may feel sweaty when they're anxious, have feel like they have to go to the washroom, have diarrhea, butterflies in their stomach, feel trembling, tired, and everyone really experiences things very differently. So you, if you um, have ever felt anxious, you may see some of these fitting for you. So this particular individual, only feels a few of these symptoms. So when they're anxious, they have a dry mouth, racing heart, upset stomach, and restless legs. So everyone feels something different. And in fact, our bodies also tell us different things when we experience different emotions. So for example, this individual is feeling anger and her body tells her she's angry by having some temperature change, muscle change and tightness, um, as well as an upset stomach. The more we know about how our bodies tell us or give us those hints about how we're feeling, the better we can recognize those feelings early and then do something to make ourselves feel better if, if we need to in that situation. The way we feel and our body sensations can lead to thoughts. So thoughts are our next stop in this model. We have millions of thoughts every day, and I know this sounds unimaginable, but in fact, we do. We don't pay attention to them all because we couldn't function. Um, but there are some that some thoughts that we do pay close attention to. There are two types of thoughts, helpful and unhelpful. Let's take a look at what those are. Helpful thoughts are thoughts that are associated with good feelings, such as happiness and excitement. So a couple of examples include, I'm a good parent. I'm excited to see my son. I'm prepared. I'm wondering if you can think of a, a recent helpful thought you had, maybe today. On the flip side, let's look at unhelpful thoughts. Unhelpful thoughts are thoughts that are associated with bad feelings or unhappy feelings, including sadness or fear. And some examples might be, I will fail, I'm a fraud, she will get sick. Um, can you think of an unhelpful thought that you may have had, unre had recently? I can. <laughs> So let's take in together, um, we can see that feelings, body sensations, and thoughts are connected and they contribute to behavior. We're gonna look at a couple examples now. In fact, we're gonna look at three examples using children. Two are kind of run of the mill, um, meaning just kind of a day-to-day -day experience. And then one is more connected to the current situation. So those individuals who were participated in the child webinar, you'll see some similarities in, in some of these scenarios. Okay, so here's Jack and he's getting ready for his first basketball game. So Jack is feeling strong, his muscles are strong, he has lots of energy, he has the helpful thought, this is gonna be great, and is feeling happy and excited. What do you think happened next? How did he behave? Well, he went to his game, he smiled at his teammates, and he really did his best. So you can see here, feelings, body sensations, and thoughts all resulted in this good outcome. Let's look at an example for someone a little older. Look okay, here's Sam and Sam's headed to a party with a friend later. Sam is experiencing dry mouth, his heart's beating fast and feeling kind of nauseous. And he's having the unhelpful thought, I don't know anyone there, no one's gonna want me there. And also is feeling quite nervous. What do you think happened with Sam? Well, Sam decided to tell his friend that his parents wouldn't let him go. And then he stayed home alone. Um, so you can see that this was kind of a, a difficult situation for Sam and that his feelings, body sensations and thoughts all connected to this kind of outcome. Let's take a look at a different example for our earlier um, child we talked about, Jack. It's a little more connected to today. Here's Jack. Jack is saying goodbye to his mom as she heads to her night shift at the hospital. Jack feels hot all over, his heart's beating fast, he has butterflies in his tummy. He has the unhelpful thought, my mom is gonna get sick and feels nervous, worried, and sad. So what do you think happened with Jack? So he cried as his mom was leaving, didn't eat his bedtime snack, and then had trouble sleeping at night. So this was really hard for him. And you can see how the feelings, body sensations, and thoughts all connect again to this outcome. Let's look at this from a different perspective. Let's look at it from a parent's perspective. Here's Zoe. This is Jack's mom. Zoe's headed off to her shift to the hospital and is saying goodbye to her son, Jack, and he starts crying and having a meltdown. So mom now is feeling hot all over, heart's beating fast and muscles are getting tight. Um, she has the unhelpful thought, of course, every time I leave, he's, he does this, I'm gonna be late. And is feeling angry 
and frustrated and sad. So what happened for Zoe? So she tried to get out of the house without any problems, but then raised her voice. Why do you always do this? Rushed out of the house without really adequately saying bye to her son and maybe comforting, um, and then found herself short with her colleagues at work. Collectively understanding and being able to recognize our feelings, body sensations, thoughts, and how they're connected help us do something to prevent negative behaviors, like in some of these examples, from transpiring um, for ourselves. But also this knowledge allows us to understand or give some in in insight about what's transpiring for our kids. With that in mind, what can we do to help our kids? So we're going to provide here some general recommendations first. Yeah. So as, we, as we've already mentioned today, each child is going to respond differently to the current situation. Parents need, maybe need to try different ways to help their kids before they find one that's really that sticks and works for them. So our first recommendation, uh, we encourage you to support and engage with your child. So give each child one-to-one -one time to meaningfully connect and check in with them. Children really benefit from consistent routines. So even if every day is a little bit different or your shift schedule is a bit surprising to your child, there's certain ways to implement consistency. And one of those ways can be having a daily check-in with them. Um, children also learn and express themselves through play. So during that time, take, take time to let them take the lead through play and you might get a little bit of insight of what's happening for them. The second is be kind, calm, and patient with your children's behavior. Um, as noted by Dr. Stonicki, giving children one-to-one -one time is important and allocating some specific time when you encourage your child to talk to you about concerns they have would be a great idea. But sometimes kids aren't really wanting to chat. And so as she indicated that even through play that's not connected to the current situation, sometimes they feel comfortable enough to kind of let those, that information out to you. So um, don't, if they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. Um, and I feel like also as parents, we're um, often concentrating on correcting behaviors that we don't like or, or don't want to see happening again. So we often pay differential attention to those negative behaviors, but try to take some time to really look, look for those positive behaviors, look for your kid doing good things and be able to reinforce that because we want those positive behaviors to um, continue as well. So take some time to find your kid doing some good stuff. And the last point is taking steps to calm down before you react. And as in, in the example of Zoe, you're, you're rushing in your house and like you don't really have a lot of time to um, take some uh, uh, really um, time intensive steps. Um, but even um, things such as just like taking a step out of the room for a moment before you kind of respond to your child or even taking a breath if you don't have time to actually step out is really important um, so that you can react in a way that you feel comfortable with and that your child can hear you because when we kind of elevate our voice our kids don't necessarily hear us yeah and taking care of yourself and focusing on self-care is important for you to be able to react uh, appropriately to your child and Again, just like Dr. Wright said, it can be really difficult to carve out time for yourself, but um, taking care of yourself will really allow you to keep your stress down and react uh, in a more effective way to your child. Um, we also understand that geographical differences and current restrictions may also impact what you're able to do for self-care and how you might be able to fit it into your schedule. But uh, we really encourage you to take, take a second today and maybe ask yourself, what's one thing that you could do just for yourself today uh, that will help you take care of yourself? So those are some general recommendations. We also have some more specific recommendations, but we sort of have a set aside sort of types of kids. And so uh, both of us will sort of provide you with some little specific direction about that. And then we'll, we'll follow that up by some specific strategies that we also already have um, uh, delivered to our children in the previous webinar, but we'll deliver to you as, as ways that you can support your children to utilize these strategies. So here's our typical kit. These typical kids will have questions off and on. They usually take what you say, think about it, and then kind of go on with their day. And they, they may come back with a question. And so what's really important, again, across all kids really, is to provide really clear, factual, age-appropriate information. So when kids are little or really concrete information um, is important. So 
we can't ignore why we're, we're actually not in school right now. There's a reason why, but you don't need to get into an expansive description of, of the virus itself, but that there is an illness and that we are taking steps to make sure we're safe. And that part of it is that social distancing and washing our hands. But as kids age, you can you know kind of give additional information because they are at a cognitive level, they can understand that. But when they're little, very concrete pieces of information are really important. Um, and even though these kids may seem not to be that bothered by what's going on, still be really aware of the exposure to media. Um, Dr. Silnicki will mention this a little more in our next uh, type of kid. Um, but even though they aren't really um, demonstrating concern, media, ex excessive exposure to media can cause problems. And so this kid might could transition into a more anxious kid potentially if they're exposed to lots of information that isn't that helpful. And the other thing, even though they might not have current emotions uh, associated with the current situation, take time to support them and validate if emotions um, um, show up and, and normalize those. Yeah. And so now we'll talk a little bit about what the anxious kid would look like. So this is the child who's going to ask those questions repeatedly. They might ask the same question over and over again, even though you've given them an answer. Um, and they might be particularly bothered what, by what they hear in the news or how you deliver information to them. So you need to be really conscious of that. Um, specifically for these children, again, it's really important to provide that clear, factual, and age-appropriate information. Um, they also don't need to, to watch the news with you. Um, you'll wanna limit their exposure to media. And for older children who are um, who, who use social media, um, you, you may wanna limit their social media time as well uh, or, or what they see on the internet. And so you can make, fun, or make use sorry, of muting, unfollowing features uh, from social media or uh, parenting restrictions on, uh, on your electronics. Um, again, we also want to acknowledge and validate their emotions. Some concern is typical and to be expected, particularly when children don't understand why they have to be away from their friends, why they're not at school. Um, but we encourage you not to only use reassurance. So reassurance is more of a short-term strategy. So by reassurance, I mean telling them that things are going to be okay, everything will get better. Um, for anxious children, this strategy actually might backfire in the long run. So Again, you can use that kind of as a short term until you maybe have time or you can figure out how to communicate with them properly um, or appropriately, but um, saying that everything will be okay isn't going to turn off that anxious feeling for them. Um, and then we're going to come to it in, in a few minutes about some specific strategies, but uh, with the anxious child, we encourage you to use a strategy that will help them calm down. So we'll provide just a few, but uh, in our last webinar for children, we, we also discuss a few strategies uh, in those child developmentally appropriate terms. And I'd encourage you, if, if you miss that, to watch the replay with your child. Um, you can also work through the cognitive behavioral model with them to help them understand what's happening in their body and mind. Uh, and like I said, we'll come to a few more in just a second. We also might have the angry or the sad child. So this child may or may not ask questions. Um, a sad child in particular, or even a sad teen might pull back from you a little bit more. Um, they might prefer to be alone. They might be kind of stuck in their room right now. Um, and for the angry or irritable child, you might feel like you're always walking on eggshells around them, um, never quite knowing when they're going to react or how they're going to react. Um, it's also really important to remember that the child who defaults to anger might be masking other emotions and anger tends to pull out different emotions from parents when they're reacting. So this is where it's even more important for you to make sure that you're taking the time before you engage in you and react in those situations. Same as before, we suggest providing that information and reacting similarly to this child as you do with the anxious child or even the typical child. Um, but the types of strategies that you might direct the child to might be a little bit different. So, for example, if you're having a sad child who is isolating themselves, staying away from the family, it might be important for you to help them come out of their room, engage in family activities. You might arrange a, a video call with one of their classmates so that they can stay socially connected. Um, but with an angry kid, then you might want to focus more on relaxation strategies. Um, 
Yeah, and then so during our previous webinar, um, we introduced three strategies to kids that they can use to deal with unhelpful thoughts and feelings. And so we're going to reintroduce those here to you again with the idea that you can direct your child to use those strategies. So here's, let's take a look at these strategies. The first one um, is really you encouraging your child to tell you or another caregiver or trusting a person um, what they feel or what they think. It's really important to not keep all those thoughts in because it can make people feel worse. Um, but what we acknowledge though, <laughs> is that sometimes it's really difficult to tell someone how you feel. And so you could, and your child may feel this way as well. Um, so you could encourage your child to write it down um, in a story or even just write down like just point form or draw or paint a picture about um, these hard feelings or thoughts. That might be a way that they would feel comfortable communicating. And then once they're done, they might, be, might feel comfortable kind of telling you about their picture or whatever they've created their, their story. A second strategy, which really links to the CB model, is really to help your child change unhelpful thoughts to helpful thoughts. Changing unhelpful thoughts to helpful ones can be very powerful and a powerful way to make you feel better. And so here's this example we looked at before. Here's Jack, he's saying goodbye to his mom as she heads off to her night shift, has that unhelpful thought, my mom's going to get sick and feels nervous, worried and sad. So what might be a helpful thought to replace, my mom's going to get sick? One option might be, my mom is great at her job. She's doing everything she's supposed to do. And so instead of feeling nervous, worried, and sad, may instead feel proud and confident. So if he changed that thought, his, his feeling could change as well. Here's another example. Here's Sam again. So Sam asks his dad about what he heard at work about COVID, and he thinks he didn't tell him everything. So his first thought is a, a helpful one. No one ever tells me the truth what's happening and feels quite angry. And what might be a helpful thought instead could be something like, he'll tell me what I need to know, I'm gonna trust him. And in doing so, if you cha change that unhelpful thought to a helpful one, um, it might feel more relieved and calm. This takes practice though. Um, so it's, it's something that, um, it doesn't just happen overnight. And it's also a practice that um, over time is helpful for adults as well. One additional strategy is directing your child to do something different when they aren't feeling good or having helpful thoughts. So here's a whole bunch of ideas you can see depicted in this image, um, playing with another kid, playing basketball, playing a game, maybe um, going fishing, et cetera. These are someone else's ideas. So it would be great for you to help your child create a list of activities that they would like to do. So they could create a, a, like a list where they write out um, what they would like to do or what are some activities they enjoy or a big poster where they kind of do it more creatively, maybe they draw pictures. Um, and the activities that would be included or should be included would be ones that they can do alone or with others, maybe ones that are quiet and ones that are loud. So, so activities that could fit in different scenarios. Um, again, this is a good thing for moms and dads and other apps as well. Now, typically we don't have a list, but we have in our, in, in our figurative back pocket to draw from. So if I'm not feeling good, you know, I might want to go out for a run. Or if I'm not feeling good, maybe I want to read a good book, right? So today, we learned a whole host of things. Um, really, that all parents are finding this time challenging. Feelings, body sensations, thoughts, and behavior are connected. And when we understand that connection, it can help us manage ourselves and help our children, give us insight about our kids. We learned some general approaches, some little more specific approaches for certain kids. The last point um, that Dr. Solnicki and I haven't mentioned is that if your child is having difficulties and they seem to persist or are getting more elevated, that it would be appropriate to reach out to mental health services. On the SIPSERP website, um, they're um, on the, the web link that's on this slide, provides links to general resources in each of the health regions or associations across the country, and um, outpatient mental health would be listed there and that you could reach out if you need additional assistance. There certainly, certainly are uh, is assistance from a private, private sector as well in your communities, and you would have to look, out that, look into that independently. So thank you today for listening. Uh, we have questions for Dr. Stelnicki and myself. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Stelnicki, Dr. Wright. Um, so we are opening up the floor to questions. Uh, please just submit them through the question box. 
Um, I'd like to start with the first question, which is um, you, you gave some examples today, of certainly with both children and some for teenagers, but um, perhaps you can highlight a little bit about the differences in um, helping those age groups through this, this time. Dr. Stelnicki, did you want to address this? Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, we did give a few specific examples for, for young people as well as teens, but what I think one of the things that we want to emphasize is that although there will be just a few differences, generally the approach can remain the same. And, and what changes is kind of the developmental, the language that you use, just you need to make sure it's developmentally appropriate. So, you know, using uh, really co concrete things when they're young, um, you get to provide a little bit more information and um, keep things a little bit more abstract when as, as children move into the teenage years. Um, and, and like I had mentioned before, really be aware, particularly with older kids, uh, about their social media use and what they're seeing on social media, because there is a lot of inaccurate information and fake news on social media. And so ensuring that there's a way that either you could monitor that or that um, you could discuss some of the things that they're seeing and, and correct any misconceptions that they might have. Dr. Ray? Just to follow from that too, we don't want to eliminate social interaction um, online for our teens mm -hmm. or our older children uh, completely because sometimes we get concerned and then we kind of cut that off. But because we really want to maintain social interaction, because right now there isn't a lot a lot of options, particularly in certain uh, places across the country, because of um, how COVID ha is still. Um, impacting us. Um, so there isn't a lot of interactions. We want to make sure we can still connect those those older children and um, our teenagers. So making sure that we still allow for that. But again, like Dr. Silnicki mentioned, maybe monitoring and um, have an opportunity to chat about what they've heard. The question is, um, if my child has become quiet, but seems otherwise okay, um, should I be concerned? Or is it something that I should be investigating? Um, Dr. Stonicki mentioned this too a little bit, but um, being quiet is fine. Um, I, I certainly would be kind of touching base and 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 not in a, a like a, a prodding way, but give opportunity to have discussion. Um, if it comes to the point where they're not communicating at all, then that would be mo much more of a concern. But being quiet um, is would be just something to watch. Yeah, and just to tack onto that, um, when you are kind of watching for those things, if they start not enjoying enjoying the things that they normally do enjoy or you can't engage them in some of their favorite activities, that might be a, a place where you, you want to investigate a little bit further. How can I help make sure that my anxiety is not making my child anxious? Well, that is a, that's a very good question. We know that um, we as parents model lots of things and sometimes we're not aware of of that um so being aware of of your behaviors would be one thing and hoping that that you have an outlet yourself if you have access to mental health support would be a good thing to make sure that you are kind of engaging in the appropriate self-care and any other strategies that would help you manage your anxiety so i think looking out for yourself specifically looking after your mental health is going to be important for your child so you aren't modeling anxious types of behaviors in the household Add Dr. Stolnicki? Um, yeah, I'll just add to, you know, that can be a really good opportunity for you to, to model, uh, again, at an age and developmentally appropriate way, model for them kind of, you know, I am feeling worried about this, and here are some things that I'm doing to, to deal with this worry. And it might even open up some conversation with your, with your child as well, but making sure that you're not oversharing and that you're keeping that uh, information developmentally appropriate. Well, um, certainly if anybody has any other questions, they can certainly send them in, but I am actually gonna turn it over to Dr. Wright to uh, do a quick wrap up for us on some things that we learned from children in our last session for parents. So during our last session, um, at the end, we opened the floor just like we did for you, and we had uh, kids write in to us about some things they're concerned with. So we walked through a couple scenarios with them, and I, wanna, I wanted to present this to you and see how they work through this. So we worked through that CB model. So here, this was the scenario that they provided to us. I can't hug my dad when he gets home because he has to wash up first. 
So the kids generated bodily sensations that they thought he might experience. So upset stomach, squishy in chest, have a headache. They generated the unhelpful thought, I will never be able to hug my dad as soon as he comes home from work. And that, that, the, that child would probably feel sad. Then we worked to generate this new helpful thought. And the one they came up with, with is that um, this is just for now. This will keep me safe for now. And so they, they thought if you change it instead of feeling sad, so if you work to change that thought to a more helpful thought, that they, that child would then feel calm, proud of their dad, protected and happy. So that was a great contribution. And here's another one. So uh, my parents come home from work at odd times or they're sent home. So that, that was the scenario that, that one of our children generated. And so then they generated how this particular little girl um, would feel in terms of body sensations, upset tummy, racing heart, sweaty. This little one might have the unhelpful thought, my parents are sick and then feel scared and confused. Then when we tried to change that thought, what they came up with was my mom is safe at home now. They're gonna be okay and I'm happy they're home with me. And then that was a, with that change, we, um, we found out an emotion change from scared and confused to excited, happy and calm. So the children did really good at doing this. And the interesting thing is, is that we just learned about this in a really short, short session and they were already able to kind of understand the idea of changing that thought. As I indicated, this, is, this takes practice, but it was really great that you know, they caught on right away. Um, so the next thing we, we asked was if, if your parents were gonna do these three strategies with you. So one, um, so changing help, help, unhelpful thoughts to helpful ones, um, to um, sit down and talk to you, talk, you know, help you talk about your emotions, and to direct you to um, find some uh, a list of good activities to engage in. How could parents help you? So this is where you pose this to them. How could parents help you do this? And so the first one was focused on tell them how you think. So how could they? How could you as parents support them? And so they generated the ideas that um, that setting time when you could chat with your mom and dad or other caregiver would be a good idea. So that a certain time during the day might be good. Um, they thought that um, if you play with them, they're more likely to be able to tell you how they feel or think. Um, one, one kid said, um, pay me a dollar per thought. <laughs> we thought that was clever. Um, and the other one was really making time to talk about my feelings. So taking time of your day. And this really goes back to our recommendations that that one on one time where you would focus on that child is particularly important and, and would facilitate them being able to talk to you. So the second one was that changing thought process that we just learned. Um, what they thought would be helpful from you, so how you could help this or facilitate this would be to talk to your child, be around. So make sure you spend that time, again, back to that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, help me with what I'm doing and help write out our helpful and unhelpful thoughts and then work to change those. So essentially sitting down with your child and having them write out their unhelpful thought and then actively working to change it. So just like we did in those examples um, with the children, to, for you then to sit down with your child and walk through this model. And then the last one about doing something different, so creating this list, um, they kind of would, wanted a, a printout of the chart we used in the presentation, so like looking at like something concrete. Um, they wanted to maybe sit down and write a list out together with you about what they can do. Um, and then they thought too, like we could do it with, like our siblings could take turns picking what we're going to do. So everyone can kind of participate in um, activity selection and thought they thought that would be fun. So the kids all generated these, um, their contributions independently, and we thought they did a really excellent job. And it's, it's really good to hear from them, uh, particularly um, to tell us as parents how we can help them, because sometimes like we don't know that we can guess, but, but when we have their opinion, it might be more helpful. So um, I'd like to give you both a chance to just uh, make any quick thoughts or wrap up comments if you want, starting with Dr. Stelnecki. Okay. Um, I don't really have too many more things to say. Um, I, you know, I would encourage if you guys have any um, other suggestions for really um, important topics as parents that you would like us to cover in future webinars, please provide those at the end where um, Dr. Wright and myself are more than willing to provide additional strategies, additional information. So, um, yeah. Dr. Wright? 
And the last thing I would say too is that really this this information we're providing is actually preventative. It's not just because the because COVID because the pandemic is here that we should start engaging in these strategies with our kids. It's important for our kids to be able to express their emotions, be able to think about ways maybe to change their thoughts to more helpful ones, and to find activities that are are helpful for them or things they can engage in when they're not feeling good. So um, this is just something that that would be help, a help, helpful set of strategies to keep engaging in ongoing to encourage um, um, good mental health in your kids. I'd like to thank you both so much for joining us today. And I wanna remind everybody that there will be a survey after the town hall that'll appear right afterwards. And we hope that you will complete that survey to give us feedback on other options we can offer you or any other concerns that you guys might have. Uh, a copy of the video will be emailed to all attendees tomorrow. Just a reminder that SIPSER does not have permission to share the PowerPoint presentation. So you can view it again on the video, but if you want more information, you can certainly contact the individual presenter if you have questions. Uh, our next town hall is June 4th, and it is titled Stress and Emergency Management. Uh, the link to register for that town hall will be in your follow-up email. Again, Dr. Stelnicki and Dr. Wright, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Everyone else, have a great day. Take care and stay safe. See you.